Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining the Southwest Center for Human Relations Studies here at the University of Oklahoma uh, for our monthly webinar series. I'm Corey Davidson, and the, uh, I'm the NCOR program assistant, and I'm delighted to be your host today. Uh, for those of you joining us for your first time, NCOR offers two webinars per month, one on the first and one on the last Wednesday. Um, our Emerging Scholars webinars are held on the first Wednesday, and they focus on ideas that speak directly to the experiences of students. These webinars are either facilitated or co-facilitated by a student and are intended to identify emerging scholars. These are always available at no cost. Please visit our website at www.ncord.edu for the full list of webinars on demand. I welcome you uh, to use the chat box to tell us where you're joining us from. Also tweet, Instagram, and share with the hashtag Encore webinars and hashtag start the conversation online. It is incredibly important for us to stay connected, especially during these uncertain times. Our uh, presenters today are Abigail Leader and the Rehearsal for Life graduate student theater troupe. Uh, Abigail Le uh, Leader is the Director of Experimental Prevention Initiatives at the University of Oregon. Uh, in this role, she directs Rehearsal for Life, a graduate student theater ensemble that addresses issues of equity and inclusion on campus and beyond. Uh, their topic today is Managing Difficult Conversations and Dynamics in the Classroom, an interactive workshop. The center is grateful for their expertise. Please post uh, any questions in the Q&A box and they will address them at the end of the presentation or throughout. Uh, please welcome Abigail Leader and the Rehearsal for Life graduate student theater troupe. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here today with us. Um, again, my name is Abigail. I am uh, the Director of Experiential Education and Prevention Initiatives within the Office of Prevention Services in the Office of the Dean of Students at the University of Oregon. And I have the honor of working with Rehearsals for Life, which is a group of graduate student actors from a variety of different disciplines on campus. And we create interactive educational workshops like the one we are about to present to you. Uh, so first, we're just gonna start with a couple of logistics. Uh, I wanted to read this land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are here on Kalapuya Ilihi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya peoples who were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the US government and white settlers over several years, but most notably in treaties between 1851 and 1855. Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to what are now the Grand Ronde and Siletz reservations and are now members of Confederate tribes of the Grand Ronde community of Oregon and the Confederated tribes of Siletz Indians and continue to make important contribution in their communities at the U of O and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. We share this information out of humility and respect for this indigenous homeland and for the indigenous people who continue to live and thrive in what is now called the state of Oregon. Uh, if you are open to it, we would love for you to share your pronouns. And uh, the way to do this is in your video box, you can rename yourself by right clicking and add your personal pronouns. I'll give you just a moment to do that. All right, grab the next slide, Bailey. So during this session, we're definitely going to be addressing sensitive content um, based on real life experiences. And we know that this kind of content can be activating. Uh, so we really want you to encourage taking care of yourself. And at the same time, we believe that it's really important to be having the frank and direct conversations that we can as a community so that we can move towards healing and social transformation. So on that note, I wanna give you a little bit of how we're planning to engage with you all. Uh, so this is going to be an interactive educational experience. Uh, we would love for folks to engage in the chat, uh, engage just by asking questions. You can raise your hand. 
Uh, there's actually even going to be some times we're going we're going to invite people to just jump in. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of people on this call, and uh, I want us all to have grace with each other uh, as we're moving through this. If it gets a little bit out of hand, we will move strictly to the raise hands. Um, but uh, our hope is to have a really robust dialogue together. And on that note, we want to encourage everyone to be really brave. Uh, you know, you don't have to be perfect. There is no perfect way to have some of these conversations. Uh, but we invite you to take risks. Uh, this is a learning environment and our intention um, is actually to create an environment where it is an opportunity for all of us to learn together how we manage uh, and move through some of these more difficult conversations. Uh, on that note, also the stories that people share stay, the lessons uh, that you gather can leave with you. Also want to note that racism and oppression exist. And if uh, you don't believe that, this might not be the best workshop for you. Uh, and we are also going to be, like I said earlier, creating an environment where we can have rich and, uh, and honest discussions. Uh, we all come from very different lived experiences. We want to uh, support each other and also be open to hearing feedback and critique of our ideas, um, but with the intention, all of it, in learning and creating a safer learning environment. So we're going to go ahead and introduce ourselves. Uh, I already did, but I'm going to pass it on to uh, each uh, member of Rehearsals for Life who is here with me today. So uh, let's see, Bailey, can you introduce yourself? Hi, hey everyone. My name is Bailey McGee, and I am the student director for Rehearsals for Life. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am a second year in the Conflict and Dispute Resolution Master's program here at the UO. And I joined RFL because it gave me the opportunity to start applying a lot of those skills that I was learning in my program into real life experiences while also getting to teach those to others. So yes, um, I'll pass to Kashal. Thank you, really. Hi, everybody. My name is Koshal Sakota. I am from Nepal. My pronouns are he, him, his. And I am a first year doctoral student at the School of Planning, Public Policy and Management. One reason why I joined IFL is to check my own privileges and try to be a better ally. Uh, so I'll pass it on to Sarda. Hi, Kishol. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. My name is Sarita Thomas. Um, I am a fifth year undergrad, University of Oregon, in um, the Architecture and the Cultural Anthropology Department. Uh, I joined rehearsals. Oh, sorry. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I joined rehearsals for life because I was so very excited to find a group that was talking quite frankly about all the isms that plague society. Um, and I wanted to be a part of that. Uh, also, please excuse my garb. I am in the ICU with a family member, um, but this type of conversation is so important to me and it was so important to my family member. I felt like it was a, it was a good idea and something I should do to be here today. Um, I will pass to Kellen. Hi everyone, my name is Kellum Tate Jones. Uh, my pronouns are she or they. Uh, and I am a fifth year member of Rehearsals for Life coming to you from the Earth Science Department at University of Oregon. And I joined Rehearsals for Life because I wanted uh, to be a part of a creative community that was engaging in uh, socio-political issues uh, from both a creative and evidence-based uh, standpoint and, and a place that would be uh, safe and inclusive for all members. So I will pass on to Manika. My name is Manika Collier. My pronouns are she or they. I am a first year master's student studying nonprofit management. I joined rehearsals for life because experimental learning is foundational to my education experience, as well as this program provides me the opportunity to share my personal story. I will pass it on to Haifa. Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Haifa and I am a third year PhD student in the political science department. 
uh, use she, her, and hers. And I, um, I joined Rehearsals for Life because I wanted um, something a little bit outside of academia. And I'm also passionate about um, acting and uh, theater of the oppressed. I did a little bit of drama for social change before getting to the University of Oregon. So Rehearsals for Life was like the best place where I could use my experiences as an international student, a woman uh, in the US in order to um, be more helpful to the community. And I pass it to, um, sorry. I will pass it to Chelsea, Chelsea, yes. Hi, my name is Chelsea. I'm a fourth year PhD student in the Earth Science Department. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I joined RFL to practice bystander intervention. I'm going to pass it to Martha. Hello, everyone. My name is Martha Benson. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm going into my second year of a master's degree in nonprofit management. Um, I joined this program because I'm really excited by theater that's used as a tool for social change, and I wanted to learn how to be a braver, better ally. And I'm going to pass it on to Si Chao. Hi, everyone. My name is Si Chao, and my pronouns are she and her. I'm at my fifth year PhD program at Department of Economics. The reason I joined RFL is because I just, I, I'm at my last year of school life, and I just want to try something new and something out of my comfort zone. I'm going to pass it to Z. Hello, my name is Z, she, her. I'm the third year drama therapy student, and I'm the intern for RFL. Um, the reason I joined RFL is that I can learn how to practice to stand up for myself and people who need it. And I will pass to Abigail. Great. Thank you, everyone. As you can see, I get to work with some really wonderful students. And um, I'm just going to explain a little bit about what we're going to do together. So uh, in a moment, I'm going to pa pass it on to three students who are going to share very personal stories about their experiences in education and academia. And uh, part of this is uh, is that I feel like it is um, rare that we are talking um, very explicitly and directly about some of the social issues that we face and how they impact us all very personally. And, uh, and because this is a session for instructors, I really, we, we really believe that it's important that we're hearing these stories of, that students are experiencing on our campus or in educational settings. And then we're gonna move on to, um, some interactive scenarios uh, that are based on the theory of theater of the oppressed, which was um, created by Augusto Boal, a Brazilian man. He was contemporaries with Paulo Freire and his belief that was that the problems within the community can be solved by the community. And so we have created a number of scenarios that are based on experiences that have happened at the university and we uh, are going to show you those scenarios, then we're gonna spend time um, deconstructing them, talking about what is actually going on. And then we're gonna spend some time actually practicing having some of these conversations. Like as if we were an instructor up to in this classroom, what would you do or could potentially say or do uh, to change the outcome of the conversation? And so we're gonna be inviting folks to actually practice uh, some of these skills and learning from one another different ways of responding. Um, so, but first we are now going to uh, hear from three students. And I actually would suggest that folks put your uh, screen in gallery view. No, sorry, in speaker view. And also if you could um, turn off your video if you are not speaking, but this is going to be Z and Sereda and Chelsea sharing uh, stories from their life. I wasn't sure. 
I was born in California and by the time I was seven, I'd lived on two continents and attended four different schools. I remember how much fun I had learning new words. It was like playing. Each syllable had a beauty and shape that connected and separated from the ones before and after in a liquid flow of sound. Learning new meanings and fitting them together made me catch my breath. At nine years old, I was reading adult novels for entertainment, but I was still seven when I started third grade, began studying at the fifth school and met my first white teacher. I was also seven when I began to doubt my sanity and my worth. The school day was over, the last bell had rung, and we'd been dismissed. My heart thumped uncomfortably against my chest, eyes hot, and throat so tight I struggled to swallow. My teacher's irritated words circled in my head. You got the answer wrong, Sereda. And that's the end of it. I looked down at my desk and the red X on my otherwise pristine sheet of lined paper swam in and out of focus, glaring at me. M-I-N-U-T-E, minute. I went back and forth, her words ringing in my ears. You're wrong, Sereda, and I don't want to hear any more about it. As letter by letter, I compared the word in my head to the one on my spelling list, and then to the one I'd so carefully inscribed next to the number 12 on my spelling test. And then I pulled out the dictionary. M-I-N-U-T-E. Minute. In my second year of undergrad, I took Intro to Biology. Outside of class and lab, we had a group project that involved raising Drosophila melanogaster, the common fruit fly. In our five-week experiment, we were going to observe the distribution of sex-linked expression in our population of fruit flies. This involves stunting the flies on eyes, counting and identifying their eye color under a dissection scope, killing them in this soapy water that was called the fly morgue, and then we would wait a few days for their larvae to hatch. Since we were not allowed to be alone, we had to coordinate with our group mates to be in the lab. One weekend, my group member and I are in on fly duty. I was super focused because I really wanted to go to the beach and enjoy the sunny Saturday. So I'm looking under the scope using a probe to move around the flies. But then I feel a hand on my butt and I smell the alcohol on my lab mate's breath. I realized that I'm in trouble. I came to the United States on July 29, 2019. It was a nice day. I cried on the plane saying goodbye to my family, ready to pursue my dream. I knew my life was going to change. When I was in Taiwan, I always thought I am a perfect girl. People like me. People love the girl who looks pretty, who works hard, who smiles all the time, who tries to contribute to this world with a good heart. Maybe not that smart, but she keeps trying. That's me. I am the glad girl. People like me. Of course, I have lots of struggles in my life or lack of confidence sometimes. But in the deep side of my mind, I believe I can deal with it in the end. I have a lot of good labels on me, and those labels created privilege for me. I graduated from the best high school and university in Taiwan, which means I'm in the top 5% of people in my society. I could easily share my perspectives in the room. My family is not rich, maybe kind of poor, but I worked hard. I got a full scholarship from my government to come to the United States. I always had a romantic relationship. In a relationship, sometimes it's like I don't need to prove myself and people will know that someone loves and appreciates me because I'm good. And after July 29th, 2019, my life changed. In the classroom, one of the first days of school, I want to share my perspective. After I spoke, people look at me like they didn't understand what I was saying. I heard my heart beat so fast and my voice was trembling. 
In the end, the professor switched the topic right before I finished my speech. I was confused. Did they really listen to me? Did that mean I should shut up? That was my first, but not my last lesson in discrimination in academia. Of course, at the time, I had no idea what was happening. All I knew was that I hadn't made a mistake. All the way home, I stared at that paper and I wondered if I'd missed a letter while studying or maybe I was reading my test wrong or was I reading her list wrong? I worried there was something wrong with me that what I was seeing when I compared my test to her list wasn't real. Had I messed up on the exam and I just couldn't see it? Monday, I went back to school and looked that teacher in the face while she handed out the next spelling list. And that Friday, she misgraded my spelling test again. Number 13, mountain, M-O-U-N-T-A-I-N. That year, I was accused of cheating three times, once in front of the whole class. That time, she docked my grade 50% for writing down the correct answers as she gave them to us, and no one else got in trouble. Year after year, I encountered instructors that accused me of cheating on exams or plagiarizing papers, and every year, at least one instructor, more often multiples, would choose humiliation as my learning modality. It wasn't lost on me that there was a distinct difference in how I was treated. Disagreements between classmates and myself would end with me in the principal's office. Seatmates would raise their hands to ask questions or ask for instructions to be repeated. When I raised my hand and asked for clarification on a point in the lesson, I was told that I should have read the text. When I asked for help on an assignment, I was told no one else needed help and shouldn't I get to work? I learned not to share my thoughts or disagree. I learned not to ask questions and never to ask for help. I wish I could say that being sexually assaulted was the only time I've been harassed in academia. But unfortunately, there was that time the professor on my solo field tour told me that silk should feel like the stuff in my panties. Or the time members from my group projects would randomly text me for nude photos. Then there was the time that lab technician kept asking me out despite my multiple rejections, and the time my internship supervisor pretended to slap me whenever I had a question regarding the biogeochemical experiment I was running for him. And then there was that time at a conference during the poster presentation when several people asked me if I was married instead of asking me about my research. And then there was that day that random dude tried to get me in his van while I was walking home from work in broad daylight, and that National Science Foundation reviewer that made a comment on my personal statement saying that if I had experienced hardships in academia, that I should have done more community service and outreach. And all of the time that I believed that all of this was normal for women in STEM. Dating here is also hard. In the United States, I'm not that cute girl anymore. I'm an immigrant. All the funny parts of me do not exist in this society. Every time people say some slam or a joke or just easy conversation, I will ask, what do you mean? When they sing songs from childhood, I can only smile. I don't have any connection to the popular cultural background. And yes, I date American guys. It is so confusing. When they say maybe or probably or I will check with you, I wonder what does that even mean? Some guy finally told me that if someone say maybe, that means 50% yes. If they say probably, it means it is 80% no. And if they say, I will check with you later, that makes 100% no. Is that even true? And what does we are more than friends mean anyway? 
I even date guys I would never ever date in Taiwan. I keep lowering my standards, but still, it's always fail. Every time at the end of this kind of friendship, I'm so confused. Am I not bad? Do they really see me for who I am or they just see the labels on me? Asia, student, woman, immigrant. I went from thinking this treatment is not right to taking responsibility for doing everything I could to try to make it better to accepting their treatment of me. Eventually, I began believing this is normal. Then matter of course, then natural. I learned that I had no worth. My words could not be believed. My concerns and ideas should be met with dismissal and my presence with derision. That for me, being talked down to, ignored or humiliated was the natural order of things. Somewhere near the middle of my first attempt at a bachelor's degree, at about 29, I started going to therapy. I was angry, fearful, and in pain, but I'd been ignoring myself for so long, I didn't even know what I was struggling with. I've worked hard in therapy and learned that I was harboring a festering self-hatred that denied my right to life. And I began to learn to identify my emotions. I'm in my 40s now, and I'm learning compassion for myself. To be unflinching in the face of anti-Blackness, racism, and all of their painful tools. I'm learning to seek community. And after years of studying, observing, and forming opinions, I'm learning to speak up and offer them. I'm learning to see that while I have many scars, flaws, and problems, I'm also wise, smart, and good. I tell myself that my words are valuable, my thoughts matter, and that yes, I know how to spell minute and mountain. I thought that these experiences were all my fault and that these were just the normal experiences for BIPOC women and STEM. One might wonder how these experiences have affected me. I still wonder every day if, like, if I'm crazy for showing up and pursuing a PhD in environmental soil chemistry. Why would I endure such abuse? Is this just what it takes to be a woman in STEM? But my passion for soils, water quality, and ecological restoration keep me going. The thought of creating a more inclusive space for BIPOC women keeps me motivated and resilient. Throughout my undergraduate and graduate program, I have never had a BIPOC female as a STEM professor. And quite frankly, I wanna be that mentor to someone. And what if I had had that? Would I have reported any of these events? Would I have fallen silent? Would I have felt cared for? Would I have withdrawn from classes that one term? I don't know, what if? I have a lot of doubts right now. It makes me wonder who I really am. My confidence is falling. Should I be what other people perceive? Or should I be how they saw me in Taiwan? It is really easy to just use my smile to interact with others. I put on a happy, innocent mask on my face. But when I look back, I see confusion, distrust, and hatred. In the deep, deep, deep part of me, I have lots of fear, anger, and embarrassment of talking to people. I've been in the United States for two years. Every time I join this kind of Zoom meeting, I have to tell myself, just go, you can do it. It's so easy for all the people, just talk. Is it that hard? Yes, it is. I do have more understanding about feeling marginalized in a society. I know empathy is so important to everyone. I'm not a perfect girl anymore. I want people to see me, not just see my good or bad labels. I want people to see who I really am. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, three of you. Um, we're actually going to come back as a whole group right now, and I would love um, for whoever feels comfortable to turn your cameras on. And let's unpin uh, the folks that oh need to be unpinned. But we just want to hear from some folks about uh, your responses to the stories that were just shared. You can put it in the chat or you can just call out. It can be kind of vulnerable sharing uh, with uh, 122 people a very personal story. And so part of our intention is, uh, is just to hear uh, how these stories are hitting you, uh, how they might be helping you think about your work and your teaching. Um, yeah. I feel so much anger <laughs> knowing that each of you went through such different, but in, in so many ways, equally terrible experiences. Um, I teach at a college level, but I am an early childhood educator, um, first and foremost. And so I have the opportunity, uh, what I love about my position is that I have the opportunity to make impacts at so many levels. Um, so thank you for sharing your stories because I, I think there was a quote at the beginning, something like the story, you might not remember everything, but the story is what stays. Yeah. That's so true. And um, just reminds me to, um, check with my students more and, and hear their stories and, you know, keeping in mind that if somebody's not sharing out in class, it might be because they've been taught not to share out um, by the responses indirect or direct that they've gotten from teachers in the past. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Anyone else want to share? Responses, things you noticed or could relate to or how it thinks of how it impacts your might impact your teaching in the future I, I for one found these stories very difficult to hear um having been the parent of a stem daughter who went to nursing school i found that some of these were unfortunately typical uh, and i think it's very unfortunate that as a society we tolerate some of this behavior Thank you. Hi. So, so I'm not a I'm not a faculty member, professor. Um, I'm the chief diversity officer at a public university, mm -hmm. and um, and oftentimes, you know, when when we do trainings, professional development um, around race and culture and so on, we always touch on microaggressions, right? But I don't think that um, I don't think that we unpack what microaggressions really do to individuals. You know, we talk about them as slight, um, slight comments that, that hurt, but listening to, um, to you all today, it's, I mean, it's, it's something that I'm going to keep in mind to make sure that I mention that it doesn't just, it's not just painful at the moment, but it can last years and years and years. Um, so thank you for sharing. Thank you. Yeah, Theo is talking about the cumulative trauma. Anyone else? Yeah, I think there's probably a lot of relating that can be done to some part of the stories. Uh, right. And then there's my mother saying it makes me wonder what to say in the moment as these things happen. And, uh, and that is a great next question, because um, what we're going to do now is that uh, we're going to show you some scenarios um, based, uh, they are microaggressions, but as we can heard and can see, those are cumulative and can add up and, uh, and the question is, as instructors or as folks that are in classrooms or on college campuses, um, what, what can you do or say to change the outcome when someone says something that uh, is 
sexist or racist or homophobic. Uh, and you know that you want to say something, but you're not exactly sure what to say. I mean, I'm, I'm sure many of us here could relate to that experience, right? Like you, uh, and you kick yourself later for thinking that, oh, I should have said this. Um, so what we're gonna do now is actually practice together and uh, recognize that there is no right way to do this, um, that we're all here to learn together and, uh, and that everyone is going to have a very different style of intervention, but, but it actually is important in our roles uh, as educators to be intervening. So uh, we are going to show you our uh, first scenario. And uh, let's see, I wanna make sure that everyone who is in that gets pinned. Um, so that is Haifa and Kellum and Bailey and Manika. Um, so if you all could turn your cameras on, that might help as well. So Haifa, Kellum, Bailey, Manika. All right. So uh, I am going to turn off my camera and we're gonna, so we're, gonna, we're going to show you a scene. And what I'd like you to do the first time we show, go through it is just to think about the dynamics, what is going on uh, in this scenario. And I, I think uh, it, it's fairly obvious, um, but let's, uh, we're gonna break it down a little bit. So just pay attention and also start thinking about what you might do or say uh, if you were in Haifa's situation as the instructor. Okay, all right, let's watch. Hello everyone. So welcome to the third week of our career seminar. You have read from our past graduates. Now I'd love to hear concerns and aspirations about the future and the job market. Um, I guess I can start. Um, I. <laughs> I'm feeling super nervous about graduating, to be honest. Yeah, no, I am too. I mean, the job market has really sucked lately. But it's not all bad news. Did you hear about Juan getting that job at Intel? Oh my gosh, yes. I saw that on his Facebook. That sounds like the most amazing job. Yeah, like I would love a job like that. But like, he's and like, didn't you hear? He's making six figures a year too. That's crazy. I want a job like that, but probably wouldn't get one. I mean, I'm just as good of a scientist as he is. Right. And like those positions are just so freaking hard to come by. Like it's totally not fair. Like the whole time he was here, he didn't do like any service work. And I've like busted my ass for years, but I think we all know why he got that job. Oh yeah. He totally got that job from the diversity conference. So unfair. I can't even go to those. Right, like I wish that, I mean, maybe it's bad to say, but like, I wish I wasn't white so I could get jobs like that. You're so lucky, Monika. Uh, I, I guess. And you're a woman too, double whammy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're gonna stop there and uh, let's have a discussion. What are you noticing? What's going on here? Um, you can just call out, what are you seeing? What are you noticing? It's fairly like blatant stuff, but it's also important for us to name it uh, and to, uh, so that we can uh, know exactly what it is that we're addressing. Yeah, Monika wasn't involved in the whole conversation. What else? Conversation also completely devalued Monika's talents as a person unto her own. Absolutely. Right. Right. Monika's talents and Juan's talents, right? Um, they're, you know, they're talking about somebody else that has been harmed. What else did you notice or what were the like microaggression moments? 
yeah, the faculty didn't address the blatant racism, exactly. There's an assumption that if a person of color receives something that is un, unmerited, undeserved, however, for the person, the white people, if they had gotten it, if they deserve it. So there's this automatic assumption that we have no talent, we have, we don't deserve what we get. Yeah, absolutely. Does this uh, scenario seem realistic to folks? Very much. Imagine this happening on campus or in, even in a class. Unfortunately, something similar happened to me at my university over dinner, over dinner once in a cafeteria. And the assumption was I, as a black woman, was only here at this university because of, I don't know, affirmative action and how I was taking space from white people who deserved to be here. There was no recognition of the hard work that I had done. The fact that I was uh, second ranked in my high school, the fact that I had, was a straight A student, that was for not. It was just automatic assumption that I did not deserve to be here. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm really sorry that happened and that it is so common. I want to mention something about the words that uh, they use, like, because I believe that words matter and the language we choose is important. And it, it, it was interesting to me how they wrapped it in a so-called positive language. Oh, you're so lucky uh, or such a great job, but the meaning was so negative. Uh, and I feel that uh, this is something that sadly happens a lot in our American culture. And when we use those so-called so positive language, uh, we don't seem to look at it as a microaggression because it's so positive. Right, but yeah, The intention Absolutely. is so different. Absolutely. Thank you for pointing that out. And sometimes it can be even harder to intervene in those situations because you're like, oh, am I the jerk? Because they're, they think they're being nice. Um, yeah. So the question that I'm posing to all of you is like, so, uh, you know, Haifa didn't say anything. She sort of let that conversation roll on. And this, uh, this workshop is about managing difficult conversations in the classroom. So, you know, what could you potentially do or say uh, if, uh, if you were in Haifa's position? Let's just like throw out some ideas. I guess you could probably maybe throw out a question of, you know, to the folks that were speaking, why do you, you know, why do you think that that's the only reason, say, that individual got the job? Mm -hmm. You know, or just trying to make them do some more critical thinking about what they said, because I think, you know, it sounded like those were kind of gut reactions or gut comments that come off without having, you know, deeper thinking about it mm -hmm. and just maybe throwing out, you know, some questions to give them pause to think about why they said it. And there they might kind of come around to maybe I don't really mean it that way. And, right. or maybe I need to just challenge my assumptions. Right, great. And uh, Stephanie had something you wanted to say? Well, I thought it was really interesting because um, before I realized that this student who received the job was BIPOC, I felt as though it was women talking about males getting a job. And so I was on, it's just interesting to look at your positionality and go, of course, a guy got a job, right? And over um, a woman and then um, bring up their, uh, you know, their color and being a BIPOC student changed it. And so I just kind of wanted to bring that to the forefront where depending on your positionality and where that is, and, and I, I don't really have an answer, <laughs> but it was just interesting for me as a white woman to have had those conversations of a course a man got the job. Um, and I don't really know what, how to sit with that, but it was just an inside. Yeah, Gosh. thank you. I thank you. I appreciate that. And, you know, depending on our identities, uh, we can, well, certainly be perceiving things from our own lens. 
And then, uh, and then as far as interventions go, uh, you know, given who you are in the world and, and the position of power that you have, or, you know, as a facilitator, or if you were just a friend, it's all going to change uh, based on your identities. Yeah, Melissa. Um, hi, uh, I work at a university as a staff person. So, but what I was thinking is I've learned uh, that the paper trail has become very important in higher education. And I'm curious to know what everyone else would think about adding something in your yes. syllabus. Are you ready uh, to go to class? Uh, what you do when a microaggression occurs as a professor. So, and it's written out in your syllabus. If this occurs, this is what happens. You practice with the students so that when it does happen, you already have a plan in place and it's written down. It's mm -hmm. not questionable. You know, it can't be questioned at that point. Um, but I didn't know if that was something that more universities might be moving to or not. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question, Melissa. I mean, I think certainly when people set ground rules or are clear about expectations, it's much either easier in the moment to go back and have, uh, have the discussion. But you know what, what we're going to do now, actually, is that we are going to, uh, these were all great ideas, right? Like, and so everyone's got a different uh, idea of potential things you can do. And we're actually going to practice having these, some of these conversations. So uh, what I would like you to do is, um, it actually works probably best if you stay in gallery view. Um, and uh, we're gonna have the same four actors back. So Haifa, Manika, Bailey, and Kellum. They're gonna show the scenario again. And I want y'all to think about what you could do or say if you were in Haifa's role. And when you um, have something you wanna say or you just can't stand it anymore, going to invite you to actually just unmute yourself and say stop and then we can uh, rewind and uh, give you an opportunity to practice. And again, you know, I, I know that this can be um, scary in front of, you know, a whole room full of people, uh, but I imagine that it's a lot less scary doing it uh, here than it might be doing it with students in real time. And so our intention here is to create a really supportive environment where we are exploring together uh, what are some of the potential gains and what are some of the potential losses of every intervention. So, uh, so let's all take a deep breath. And I want you to, uh, again, imagine that you are in hypha situation and have an, and when you have an idea of something you might want to try again the right way uh, say stop so uh, let's watch welcome to the third week of our career seminar um, you have heard from our past graduates now i'd love to hear concerns and aspirations about you know the future and the job market Oh man, I mean, to be honest, I'm just like, I'm super nervous about graduating. Yeah, me too. I mean, the job market has really sucked lately. But it's not all bad news. Did you hear about Juan getting that new job at Intel? Oh yeah, I saw that on his Facebook. That sounds like the most amazing job. Yeah, and like, he's gonna be making like six figures a year. Oh my gosh, I want a job like that, but- I'm to class now. Probably won't get one. I mean, I'm just as good as he is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I I actually can't see who's talking. Um, is there was there someone that said that they were willing to give it a shot? Uh, maybe not. Okay. Maybe. Uh, Let's let's uh, let's start again. Actually, let, from Bailey's last line. I want a job like that, but probably won't get one. I mean, I'm just as good of a scientist as he is. 
Right. Totally. And like those positions are just seem so hard to come by. And it's, I don't know, it's really just not fair that he got that job. Like he didn't do like any service work during his time here. And like I've busted my ass for years, but I think we all know why he was able to get that job so easily. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. And I would have stopped earlier right after Bailey's first comment. We um, can take it back to there. Okay. All right. Uh, I want a job like that, but probably won't get one. I mean, I'm just as good of a scientist as he is. And I probably would have stopped it right after that first point of, I probably won't get a job like that. And I would have said, well, why not? Just to try to maybe I see try to stop it before it starts going yeah else. yeah so if you're if you're willing rachel to just uh let this play out a little bit so uh bailey why don't you say the first your first line and or that part of that line and rachel you can jump in uh yeah i want a job like that but probably won't get one why is that bailey uh well you know he um i heard he got the job at a diversity conference and I can't even attend those, so I, I don't think I'd be able to get one. Can you explain a little bit more about what you mean there? Well, I mean, I'm I would feel uncomfortable going to those because I'm I'm a, I'm white. And so he definitely has like the upper leg on being able to go to those and be able to get those jobs. So you think he has an upper leg on getting a career because he's attending a diversity conference? Yeah. I guess so, yeah. All right, let's stop here. So Rachel, how was that? And and do you, great job. And do you wanna um, say a little bit what, about what that was like or? Um, it's always scary to say anything in a group of strangers, mm -hmm. um, but it's just, it was so uncomfortable. I couldn't not say anything. <laughs> um, and uh, And just, it's just really sad to see these, conversations happen um and I don't I don't want them to happen right so I'm just doing what I can to try to expose people's biases maybe make them think about it um and to help um you know vulnerable populations as well helping people um who are being hurt by these microaggressions and um and discrimination great thank you yeah. Thanks. And thanks for being the brave first person to, to step in. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I would love to hear from folks. What, what did Rachel gain from this intervention? What, what is, uh, you know, with every intervention, there's gains and losses. So what did she gain? And actually, you know, if, you, if you're available to, it would be wonderful if folks could turn on their camera. Uh, not a bunch of pressure, but it's going to feel a little bit more community oriented and like we are all in this together if we have our cameras on. So, so let's talk about the gains. Um, right, uh, perhaps more comfort and confidence to speak up in the future, brought it back to Bailey's character, took the, the focus trust of BIPOC of students. Say that again, Caitlin. The trust of the BIPOC students who might have been in the room. Maybe, yeah. Uh, I, I'm curious to hear from uh, Monika. Do you want to say anything about gains or losses from that intervention from your standpoint? Um, gains is that the focus is off of me as a, uh, a woman of color. Uh, and yeah, it forces the students to think more about what they said. Any potential losses of an intervention like this? You know, part of the reason why it's so hard to do these interventions is because uh, we're afraid of the losses. So let's let we can let's name them. I can go. Um, no, go yeah. ahead. Oh, amazing! Yeah, I feel like there's like. There's like two things that I'm seeing happening. There's one thing that's like the idea is that like people of color who get positions aren't deserving or there's some question about competency or skill. But then I think there's also another half of like 
why programs like this exist in the first place and that like regardless of like questioning people's of co people of color skills there's like a systemic sort of issue a structural issue that's being addressed that's outside of individuals so i feel like what was lost is that like in the moment we or what was gained in the moment we didn't have to focus on the individual sort of like doing that but what was lost is that we didn't have the conversation about why programs like that exist in the first place um and why they're important i think would be one of the losses i've seen is like it's not about the individual but about sort of that structural sort of context to be like why do you think maybe a question i would ask is like why do you think programs like that exist like why are they important um which might be helpful yeah yeah, thank you. And that's a great point. Like sometimes uh, in the moment, the best thing to, you can do is get the focus off of the um, off of the person that's being targeted or making feel uncomfortable, but you might be losing the learning opportunity. Um, yeah. I'm curious if anybody uh, wants to give an intervention like that a try with this scene. I'd like to, to um to just say and pick up from where Bailey was when she said, yeah, I guess I really am concerned that he had this opportunity um, at the diversity conference that I didn't. I think that um, that would have been a good, a good opportunity um, to do what the last right. speaker was just saying, but also to kind of find a place of commonality and bring it back to the topic of the careers, which would, I, I, I may have said something like, you're right. Wait, wait, I'm gonna actually working. gonna stop you right here and see okay. if you are willing to give it a try uh, with the actors. Um, so uh, can we just take it back to when Bailey actually made that statement? Uh, okay. I want a job like that, but probably won't get one. I mean, I'm just as good of a scientist as he is. Yeah, and like, I just feel like those positions are just so freaking hard to come by. And like, it's not even fair because like he didn't do any service work during his time here. And like, I've been busting my ass on that for years. But I think we know exactly why he was able to get that job. And oh, yeah. Why do you think he was able to get that job? He got that job at a diversity conference. Yeah, which is like totally not fair because like, I don't know, I just, I feel like opportunities should be open to everyone. And if you're getting them in a diversity conference, like, I don't know, I wouldn't be able to get that job. So it's it's really interesting, isn't it? How important networking is to getting to getting employment. And it sounds like you feel like he gets this opportunity at this diversity conference. Um, and it's it's unequal. It can be unequal, right, in terms of the access that different people have to different folks. And so in many ways, it's great, I think, that Juan had this opportunity at diversity conference, because a lot of times people of color don't have those same opportunities to network in ways that are going to get you those jobs. And so um, women also face those challenges. So what are some, maybe we can brainstorm together about what are some opportunities that you might have to network and to find those connections. I know professors are a great um, start for that. So maybe we can talk about other ways that, um, that, that you can also start finding those connections and ways to network. What do you think? All right, I'm gonna stop it here. Uh, Roxana, do you wanna say anything about what that was like for you? Or... Well, well, <laughs> In a real situation, it's, you know, you begin to feel that frustration and anger start to build up, but you know you can't let the students see that. And so you want to find a way to turn it back to the point of what the discussion is to address the sort of underlying, um, the underlying themes that are coming out in their statements, but also turn them back to what it is they're talking about and, and find, find a way to, to kind of address the problems in their comment, but still keep it on, um, on point in terms of on, on topic. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I have a question. I, yeah. Is there ever a time when it is appropriate to show that frustration? Because I think that part of my gut reaction and I wouldn't know if it was appropriate or not, is to remark, you know, for our white students, your entire lives have been a diversity conference. Like you've 
you've had these advantages built in from the moment of your birth that our BIPOC students don't have. And um, I do, do want- think that we're often reluctant. It's this, we're sort of. Well, let's, um, let's try that. Let's try it. Let's just see in an experiment. We're not going to hold you okay. to it. You don't have to do it next time. <laughs> if something like this happens, but let's just see w- what happens uh, with that, with, with the actors. So uh, is there a particular line that you want to address? Um, um, maybe, maybe saying that it's not fair. I didn't get to go to the diversity. That's not an opportunity that's open to me. Um, great. Let's, let's say that one. Let's Bailey. Okay. Yeah, he totally got that job for my diversity conference. So unfair. I mean, I can't even go to those. Right. But can you recognize that you've had many other opportunities throughout your life that might be far greater than one diversity conference that the student was able to go to? I mean, I don't know. I just, I kind of feel like it's not like he just kind of has a leg up, like he didn't have to do the service work. He just sort of automatically was able to get this job because of something that like none of us can control. And how do we know that he hasn't done the service work? Oh, I mean. That sounds like a really big assumption that we're making. And I would encourage you to question why you've made that assumption about this person. Okay. All right, freeze. It's really uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, so yeah, what, what, what did you feel like you gained or lost um, in, in that? Yeah, you, do you wanna speak um, to I mean, I feel like what I, on a per, personally for me, what I gain is feeling that I'm doing my, my I'm doing my, res, I'm, I'm, acting responsibly mm-hmm. as a person, a person who has privilege and that there's a responsibility that's tied to that, mm-hmm. um, that I always want to carry out for all populations. Um, I'm thinking of women in BIPOC in particular. Um, and I think a lot of times in, in particular in the environment that I'm in either people of privilege are checked out completely and aren't going to say anything and aren't, aren't going to risk feeling uncomfortable or we're willing to take that risk. Um, but it also feels like there could be a, a, a personal cost for us who might, you know, be vulnerable in terms of promotion and tenure and things like that. Yeah. And, uh, Anyone want to speak to the potential losses, right? Like sometimes the gain of uh, of just speaking up to your values and and your morals and knowing what's right is is a gain enough in itself to do that. Um, but I think you were speaking to some of the, yeah, uh, Jeffrey. Do you want to speak? Yeah, I wasn't real crazy with that. Crazy about that answer. Um, it shut both of the other students down. Missed an opportunity to encourage them to continue to explore their own opportunities rather than. Um, be jealous of someone else's opportunity. I, I would definitely have taken a different tack on that. Uh, maybe we do know that this student didn't do service. We really don't know that. Um, and I think the assumption that everyone who happens to be of a particular color is somehow automatically not qualified to do a job or not able to take a job is something that's a little bit dangerous ground to get on. Okay, so I want to stick with what Kat is saying in terms of, of the potential gains and losses. And then Jeffrey, I want I want you to have an opportunity to try to say what you said as opposed to critiquing the scene. So uh, Kat, any other potential losses uh, for Kat? I think we see that we see the students shut down and there's a part of me that is like, good, let them feel shut down. <laughs> I kind of want them to have to sit with that discomfort for a minute and think about what the consequences are of the way that they're thinking and approaching that. And at the same time, I think the awareness of uh, what it means for, yeah, blowback for the instructor. Um, I, I, I teach in a federal military uh, school. And so... Um, 
your tax dollars pay my salary. A student, I, I, at least once a year, I have a student who complains that I shouldn't be working here, shouldn't have my job because I've said things that they find offensive as white men. Um, and I, I lost a lot of the sympathy for, for that. And I, I think sometimes, you know, there's a lot of shame in this whole business of, on kind of on all sides. And um, sometimes it, it can backfire to, to play that card, but sometimes it, it, they kind of need to feel a little pinch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm curious. I want to move on to an, the, our next scene, but I also, uh, Kellum and Bailey, any reflections from your character's perspective that you want to speak to? Like, might you learn something? I feel like almost every time that we've had somebody at this point try um, <clears throat> an intervention, I was always put in the spot of like, really having to rethink what I was saying. Like, they were like, is that like, why do you feel that way? And it was like, I either have to, like, I'm like, wow, I'm being kind of racist right now, or I'm not giving this person their worth of why they were able to get that job. And like saying it out loud repetitively puts me on that spot of like, okay, I really need to think about what I'm saying right now, which was, I, I think a learning experience. Yeah, thanks. Kelly, <laughs> did you wanna say anything to that? Okay, great. Um, so we're, we've got two more scenes for y'all and I, I do wanna move on. I'm curious, I, I see Joshua's got a, his hand up. Is there anything you wanted to say? I just wanna say that it's interesting that they, the students are making the assumption that they can't attend the conference. Like yes. the conferences. I mean, to me, that's just really funny. I think I would have called them out right away on that and been like, well, why, why don't you wanna go? Like, you know, just start to feel out where, what their thoughts are on that. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, great. Okay, so we have, um, we're gonna show you another scene and this actually is a scene where as the instructor, uh, you actually uh, are uh, the one that makes the mistake and then are called out in public. <laughs> so what do you do there? I wanna check in though, uh, Kaushal, are you still here? Cause I know that he had class that he needed to get to. Okay, maybe he is not still here. And Haifa, are you here? Haifa is not here. Okay, Kaushal is here, yay. All right, um, thank you for being here still. Um, so uh, the next scene uh, is with uh, Kaushal and let's see, who else is in that scene? Do you wanna identify yourselves on mute and? Great, so Callum, Bailey, Chelsea, Kaushal, Martha, Manika. All right. Um, so yeah, if you all could unmute uh, if you're in the scene and we're going to play it out. All right, Manika. Class, we've been talking about how it's important to think about the culture of the communities you're working with. I like you to think about what it was like for you in your own culture, and then we can hear for some people about their experience. Kushal, I love to hear about what it was like growing up in Nepal. Uh, I don't feel like I'm up for sharing right now, but thanks for the opportunity though. Oh, come on. We actually really want to learn from a lot of different perspectives. Honestly, I've been approaching this from a very white limited perspective. I need to learn from your story. Uh, well, there are actually a lot of stories and information out there already, like books, studies, videos that are available. Yeah, and like, it's really not cool to put someone on the spot like that. It's pretty tokenizing, yeah. especially for like a teaching method. But if people don't share their stories, how are we supposed to learn? Right? I mean, this program values diversity and we make all this space for people to talk about their experiences. Mm -hmm. We want to hear diverse perspectives like yours. And isn't that the whole point of the diversity initiative that you're a part of, Kushal? Um, I don't know, guys. Like, I kind of feel like we're focusing on the international community and derailing the conversation. Like, we need to be focusing on the community as a whole. Like, everybody has a story to tell. So, 
So we'll stop here. So noticings, let's just deconstruct what, what just happened. I thought it's interesting how the white students just assume that everything is actually for their benefit. Like we white students need to learn from you. So you have to make the sacrifice of telling your story because that's what diversity is really about. Somehow it still has to cycle back around to privileging the, the white people in the classroom. Yes, absolutely. Any other noticings? So what what is it? What do you imagine uh, if you were the instructor? You asked for someone to share their experiences. Then somebody else says that you are being tokenizing. Like, what do you do in that situation? What's appropriate? And Callum points out, and the instructor has also totally lost control of the class. Sharing some apologies, acknowledging it, owning it. Right. And so I think that um, that this is a really interesting and tricky perspective as a faculty member, right? Or as an instructor. And how do you do that in a in how do you do that? And how does your identity impact how you do that? Um, and so I would love to see some examples of this. Um, and, and I think we could, could all learn from, from how one might do this, right? Like it's not an easy thing to do in front of a classroom. Uh, it's not, an, sometimes apologizing isn't even an easy thing to do if it's one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> so um, so what, what could we do or say? And, and I'm curious if there's anybody that wants to try it. And uh, yeah, I don't know. And Jeffrey, I said that you would get an opportunity to intervene. So if you are interested in trying this, please do. Um, no, thank you. I had to step away from the, um, my, the camera for a minute. So I can't intervene. Okay, anymore. all right, thanks. Is there anyone that feels willing to just like right now, you're like, okay, I'm willing to give this a try. Yeah. Do you still have your hand up from earlier or? <laughs> <laughs> that was an earlier hand raise, but I'll give it a shot if you. Okay, uh, great. So uh, I don't know if you remember the whole scene, but there's, uh, but um, Chelsea names that, uh, that asking was somewhat inappropriate and tokenizing. Should we take it from that moment or do you want to go back? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. Yeah, whenever you're ready, Chelsea. Yeah, and like, it's really not cool to put someone on the spot like that. It's pretty tokenizing as a teaching method. You know, you're absolutely right. I, I think I need to rethink my position here and um, I don't wanna put anybody on the spot that wasn't really, I, I guess I was, I was eager to hear uh, Kachal's story and I, I um, kind of overstepped, but Absolutely, um, nobody has a, an obligation to share a story that they're not comfortable sharing in this room. Uh, that's not a that's not a position I meant to put anybody in, and I apologize. Um, why don't we start over and uh, think about other ways that we could, you know, uh, get this information? So how'd that feel? Good job. How'd that feel, Leo? <laughs> It felt okay. I, I'm good with it. I, I have been in this position before. Um, I also really make a point when I do have a student that um, puts themselves at, at risk in the classroom that I reach out to them afterwards and thank them and acknowledge that they've done that. And then I, I understood that that was risky and difficult. And I think that that, mm -hmm. I don't know, it helps. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that's another great point to keep in mind that um, that actually these interventions don't have to stop in the classroom. That you, you do have opportunities, even even the next class, to come back to something that was said or done, or 
to talk to people outside of the classroom that, um, and if anybody wants to play out any of that um, around some of these scenes, we can certainly do that as well. Is there anyone else that wants to give it a shot? Uh, you know, that was Theo's way of doing it, but there obviously are as many ways of doing this as there are people in this room. So anybody want a chance just to practice? Again, rehearsing for life. I can. Great, thanks, Caitlin. Do you know where you would like to take it from? Or just the same thing? Or? Um, I think where Chelsea was, um, that same line. Yeah, great. Chelsea. Yeah, and like, it's really not cool to put someone on the spot like that. It's pretty tokenizing as a teaching method. You know, Chelsea, you are absolutely correct. And before I move forward, I would like to formally apologize to Kashal. I'm so sorry for putting you on the spot. That was not my, my intention. I was just very eager to hear your story. And I realized that there are also other stories in the room and we could, we could really learn from everyone. So I'm so sorry for putting you on the spot. And I'd like to apologize to the classroom as well. That was, that was classroom mismanagement on my part. And I will absolutely work to do better. And I will take this experience and learn from it. Um, if you guys want to talk about this on a one-on-one -on -one matter after class, I'd be more than happy to stay and to make sure that everyone leaves this classroom feeling a little bit better. How was that for you, Caitlin? It was nervous. I was nervous. <laughs> Do you want to say more about that or why or what? what? Um, so I am instructional staff, so I don't teach very often. And when I do teach, it's not a specific subject. I teach our like first year experience course and our academic mindset course. So those types of situations don't come up very often for me. So that was kind of the first time I've ever had to confront a situation like that. So gains and losses of that sort of intervention. It was a little bit different than Theo's. What are some... Um, Right, good question. Do you want to thank Chelsea for stepping in and naming the issue? Uh, I feel curious about any potential gains or losses that y'all are noticing. I really appreciated Caitlin's uh, sort of focus on intention versus impact, because I think what that does is it makes it, I mean, I mean we're focusing on Chelsea here as the person that was kind enough to call this out. Uh, and uh, I think part of the part of the bigger picture as an educator is that we, this instructor, fostered a classroom space where the students feel comfortable speaking out when something happens. Because many classroom spaces, that's not the case. Students don't feel comfortable saying to their faculty member, "What you've just done is actually kind of not okay." Um, so, so there's this uh, interesting way of of this all happening for me just looking at a macro level, the fact that Chelsea felt comfortable doing that with her professor um, says something I think about the classroom space. And so uh, I love that Caitlin brought in the idea of intention versus impact, right? My intention was not this, but I'm, I'm realizing that actually my impact has been this. And, and what do we talk about all the time? We talk about impact versus intention. And, and um, my impact clearly could have been detrimental, you know? And so I appreciated her conversation about that. I think there were some gains to be had. Thank you. Spencer, you have something you'd like to say? Yeah, <clears throat> I wonder I wonder if maybe one loss though is, um, you know, looking at this this dialogue early on, you know, the student stops you. I, I, I would worry that if I were to um, apologize too profusely, that actually might make um, the student who didn't want to share more uncomfortable. You know, they were already kind of wanting to be not in the focus, but now they're kind of at the center of this this big classroom conversation. So I'd, I'd, I'd feel, you know, of course, a need to say, thanks, uh, thanks for checking me there, and kind of try to not ignore what happened, but also move on. Um, so, so the student who didn't want to share isn't still kind of forced against their will into the spotlight that day, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know how clear that thought came across, but that's something I'd worry about is making something worse by apologizing too hard. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm curious, Kashal, how that was for you. Do you want to say anything? Sure. Uh, so 
with my current mindset, I would say that I got some agency by taking that whole conversation away from me. But if I was, this was my first ever term at UFO, then I was, I would, coming from a high context culture, I would say like, did this put me into trouble uh, because I didn't answer my professor's question or the professor has to open those eyes because of my action or things like that. So because I still struggle calling my professors with their names. So there's a lot of unlearning as an international student that I have to go through to, to normalize this as well. But uh, with current mindset, I felt I got an agency. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think this speaks to what we've been trying to convey that there, there, there are uh, potential gains and potential losses and that there's actually no way to get this right. Um, and it's more about the practice and the willingness to try. I think in, in every intervention so far, uh, it seems as though the target has felt a little bit more supported by the faculty member. Um, yeah, we're, we're actually, um, we've got like four more minutes before we wrap up. So I, I guess I'd love, just love to keep the conversation going a little bit about uh, some thoughts around uh, takeaways or gains and losses that you're noticing around interventions or any other thoughts about the, the scenes that we've played out. One of the things that I've been wondering about, um, all of these scenarios focused on what the faculty member or instructor can do reactively in a situation. And so I was curious if we could talk a little bit about proactive ways that we can circumvent some of these issues from even coming up. Not that that will fix everything, right? Um, but I, I try to teach um, and develop relationships proactively. And so I was curious if I could hear some ideas um, from maybe some of the crew that you have. Well, I'll, I'll leave this open to anyone. Uh, you know, we spoke earlier about potentially having something in the syllabus that you could point back to, or some group agreements that you could point back to. I'm curious if there's anyone else that has ideas, any practices that you have. I mean, I, I include in my um, syllabi our um, statement on diversity that the university uses. Um, we also have an anti-racist, anti-bias statement within our unit. Um, so I try to include that language in our in my syllabi so I can refer students back to that if necessary. Great. Thanks. All right, Arian and then Patricia. Well, I guess to sort of respond to the question that was just posed, one of the strategies that I find that works in my work is um, modeling the kind of vulnerability both as sort of taking responsibility and um, sort of intervening. And so telling, I mean, maybe obviously if the opportunity hasn't presented itself, maybe even just telling stories of times that I've screwed up um, sort of in the context of the class and like created a conversation around how, uh, you know, I'm naming how grateful I was that someone called me out or or that I was able to get that reflection or have someone hold up a mirror so that I could learn from it and do better next time. Um, that seems to work sometimes. Thank you. Patricia? Hi. One of the things I do with my classes, and I've done it for some time, is to have them create guidelines at the start of this semester where we talk about uh, how we want to treat one another, how the class may bring up various issues, but how it's kind of a shared power. We use, I use restorative justice principles and that has seemed to really assist us because then periodically we go through them in the course of the semester to uh, address, are, are we doing those kinds of things? I also talk about vulnerability and openness and personal risk and that you can always pass. So that's kind of set up to begin with. So I found those to be very helpful. Thank you. So um, I just want to appreciate you all. Um, we uh, we actually didn't even get to our third scenario uh, because the conversation was so rich and uh, and. Oh, Abigail, uh, uh, this is Jane, and 
I know we have run out of time, but I could add 15 more minutes because I feel like if there are some folks who have time, uh, we need to hear that, that that scenario and whoever is available to stay should stay. <laughs> okay, uh, great. Are there, I, I need to check with my actors. Are y'all, is that gonna work for you all? Oh, if you wanna take the 15 minutes for Q and A, that will be helpful too. I feel like we need a little bit more time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Um, well, all right, I guess I want a little uh, show of hands who wants to see uh, the next scenario. And uh, I see like one, two, three, four, five. Okay, great. Um, so it seems like uh, we will show the next scenario, maybe do one intervention with it, and then a, a little bit of time for Q&A. Um, and also for those that have to leave, thank you so much for being here. Um, so, uh, all right, let's see our third and final scenario. And we'll, we might even just deconstruct that one uh, when we're done. So, uh, and, uh, Let's see, Emma, you had something you wanted to say? Oh, I was just agreeing. Uh, with okay, gotcha. that scenario. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. All right. So, uh, so who is in the final scenario? You can just call out your name and Nika. Chelsea. D. Manika, Chelsea, Z. Who else? Michelle. Show. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then those of us, um, I think it might make it easier for to track if um, we put ourselves in, uh, we stop our video and you can put yourself in speaker view just to watch the first scene through. All right. Uh, we're waiting for seashell. Okay. Um, to conclude, my results. Actually, wait, wait, wait. I'm going to stop you right here because you're not pinned yet. Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right. Go for it. Okay. To conclude, my results demonstrate a clear relationship between the volume of dissolved gas in ascending magma and the height of the volcanic plume. Thank you so much, Sichao. We now have time for some feedback and questions. Does anyone have any? Great presentation, Sichao. I thought you used some really novel techniques for your data analyst. Yeah, I um, I thought your use of Bowen's reaction series, like that was really cool. Um, but um, to be honest, like I had a really hard time understanding you at some points. Like I think maybe working on your pronunciation would help your audience like really understand what you're talking about. Um, I was actually hoping to get some feedback on how I set up my hypothesis. Yeah, I thought your science was fine, but I think maybe you should work on your subject verb agreement. Yeah, I mean, like, it's pretty, like, basic stuff. Like, I know you said that you're in English tutoring right now, too. So maybe, like, you could bring that up at your next session. Like, I don't know. We just, like, we really want people to take you and your science seriously. Look. So child, we don't mean any harm. I know that English is pretty much the hardest language to learn. So great job on all your improvement, but your accent is still really too thick. Maybe just think about speaking more clearly. All right, so let's come back as a group, gallery view, and uh, maybe with your cameras on. Uh, so, uh, the last time we did some Encore presentation, the, the conversation around this went uh, went for a really long time, and I think uh, we, we don't have that time now, but I really do uh, want to deconstruct this. And, and we have a question in the chat, is that really something that happens? And uh, the answer is yes. So, Shall we talk about it a little bit more? What are uh, reactions, thoughts? How might you handle this if you were the faculty member? 
just a reaction of thought I'm the one who asked that question. I have an accent, <laughs> I'm an immigrant, and I have never been said something like that, but um, the undercurrent is undermining, I think, what I am saying uh, and pretending it wasn't heard or when someone else says it, uh, the credit goes to someone else. So um, I think it's a, another uh, situation with the same problem. Yeah, thank you. And sometimes it might not be as overt uh, as this one was. Yeah. Any other comments about the scene or what you could do? Callum. So we've played this scenario in other workshops before and something that was brought up by, um, by a white student one time when we played this scene was her experience traveling to Spain and speaking uh, Spanish with an American accent. And she was, was relating to us that she wasn't upset by people correcting her pronunciation in Spanish and that she couldn't understand why this was problematic. And so I thought it might be interesting to kind of consider that a little bit more, that there is sort of something more going on than just a non-American accent, maybe open up to what people's thoughts are about that. So I think that's often a place where, where white people get hung up and get stuck in sort of miss some of the dynamics that are going on here. Um, I will speak from a different perspective. Um, so I used to be involved with learning French and a lot of my peers, including my partner, spoke French. And when I pronounced things in American accent, I, they would laugh and I would get upset, really upset at it. It annoyed me. Thanks. Uh, April. I just had two thoughts that I wanted to share on that. I also was an exchange student. I went over to Portugal and had people correcting me and telling me to speak better, but I also lived that experience with a certain positionality, right? And when you're in Europe, especially maybe not now, but when I was there, um, Americans were so cool. And so you just, I, I didn't ever feel oppressed or minoritized. Um, so I think it's a very, very different experience. My second point is that we are in, in, those of us that are in higher education, this is a learning space. And so that would have been a great opportunity for the faculty member to jump in and say, okay, what we're trying to do here is provide concrete feedback on the research. That's what we're doing. This is, you have to know this for your professional life. You're going to need to know this for your colleagues. And so that would have been a great place to interrupt. Thank you. Other thoughts? Bye, Chelsea. Thanks for being here. <laughs> I don't know how you would acknowledge this or if it needs to be acknowledged, but I think I just don't understand people. I just don't understand how some people don't don't realize how hard it is to learn the English language to begin with. It's very complex. There are a lot of rules that don't make sense all the time. Um, I lived in Japan for three years when I was in high school and everyone was just so gracious and they, they, they saw the effort that I was putting in to speak their language, to connect with them. And Americans, for some reason, don't get that concept. The fact that someone is here to they've learned your, they're trying to learn your language so they can, you know, bring you more knowledge so they can bring you more experiences. And Americans don't look at it that way. They're looking at it like you're troubling me because you don't speak English in a country that actually doesn't have a designated language, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I just don't think the appreciation is there from Americans, which is sad. 
Uh, Gang A? Yes. Um, I'll speak about as a two perspectives. Um, first, if I'm a student who presented to get this comment, and I'll just ask question back, which part of my presentation you cannot understand? Can you articulate your question? And then I'll answer if these students generally miss some point and want to know, and I'll articulate, even I'll use the Blackboard or whatever, PowerPoint or Zoom, the writing. And as an instructor, if, if this question is toward and students said that you need to take some pronunciation class, other things, I'll tell them first um, that pronunciation class can help a little bit, but biologically, neurologically, the pronunciation cannot be changed at a certain point of the age. So we should not ask the things that cannot be changed. But instead, um, if you want to help the students, you can approach personally and ask them other things, you know, um, you know, we can have some conversation in out of the class, but not point the students in front, ask that um, the students cannot change. So I'll just point out as an instructor, uh, the fact, scientific fact that pronunciation at some point cannot be changed. So we'll just focus on academic point and ask which question you want to more articulate. Thank you. And it, and it speaks to an interesting uh, question around, uh, you know, trying to get someone to change as opposed to maybe asking the students uh, to, to change how they're, they're listening. Um, because that actually can adapt. We can hear adapt to people's accents. Uh, can I? Attention. Yeah. Can I pose like kind of a snotty question from my character's viewpoint? <laughs> sure. So, what? okay, I would say, okay, well, you know, I don't understand what Sachao is saying. So how can I, if I can't understand her through her accent, then how would I be able to get an A on a test or understand this hypothesis? That's the question I want to pose. Anybody have an idea about how you might respond to Monika? <laughs> it's a great question. Yeah. You know, I don't want to take it twice, but um, I often, in my instruction, I often use notes and before the class and after the class. And I told the students at the beginning that some of the, my pronunciation probably you guys not used to. So I'm really happy to um, get your question during the class or after the class. If you don't understand, let me know. And um, I use other, other material like um, summary or repeat with a very clear PowerPoint. But I got that some of the students are very frustrated, cannot understand but also I know my limit too. So then I'll make, um, I cannot say that in the classroom, uh, maybe this class is not for you, but I'll always say, I'll help you as much as possible um, as I can. Thank you. And yeah, and it is a, an interesting a distinction because you know, as a faculty member, Monika's co comment um, makes sense if she was a little bit more than a classmate that is giving a presentation, right? And so, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Kathleen, you had something you wanted to say? Yeah, I was just gonna say in this case, especially since it's a thesis, wouldn't there also be a written component? So you could work with the student to look at the written component and provide feedback based on that. Right, yeah, thank you. You could say, Monika, if you want to, you could actually read her thesis and give feedback that way. Um, and uh, let's see, okay, we are now running out of time. I just wanna check in with Seashaw. Do you have anything you wanna say uh, from your character's perspective? Um, to be honest, um, I actually always appreciate people would correct my pronunciation because I want like my next presentation to be better, but I won't appreciate people just point out me like a, 
when I was presenting or like in front of everyone else, like if they can just email me later or just talk to me later, like in per like a person like a like a like in private, I would appreciate that a lot actually. So uh, as we wrap up, I just uh, would love to hear any more reflections on, on our time together. What are you taking away from this? Roxana, you had something. Just um, wanted to comment on the, someone made a point about learning to listen differently. And I uh, had a colleague from Malawi whose uh, students would have trouble with her accent. And so she would um, take a moment at the beginning of the semester to, to acknowledge that to acknowledge that some of them may have trouble and that she would go over the ways, different sounds that they might be unused to and say, okay, so when I say it like this, you know, this is what you might be used to hearing, but um, but here's how, how, you know, here's how I pronounce it. And so to help them, so she would kind of point out different ways that she says things to help, to, to help them hear what she's saying. And so that was one of her strategies was to help them to hear what she was saying a little bit, to listen in a different way. And so she would kind of point out those different um, sounds. Interesting, that's great, thank you. So reflections, takeaway, uh, what, are you, what are you left with? What are you leaving with? Thinking about. Maybe somebody that we haven't heard from yet. I won't make you intervene. It seems like we've got some hands up, but I can't see who they are. Can someone just speak? <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, I was just going to say that uh, I think especially in the case, the last situation, but in many situations, framing can be helpful. You know, framing a discussion, making sure that it's clear what we are critiquing, what we aren't critiquing, um, you know, framing the whole class by those commitments we talk, people were commenting about. Um, you know, I think putting things in context for the students helps. And if you do a lot of legwork beforehand, it makes the class easier. You know, the more, the more prep and the more, your syllabi has everything covered and all these things are, are laid out beforehand or early in the class, it, it helps later on, it makes everything much easier. Great. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate this. Yeah, I thank you. I appreciate the framing uh, and the making visible that there is no right approach, that whatever we do, there are going to be gains. I, I like this idea of gains and losses. Mm -hmm. and losses and and to um i generally tend to intervene um and i have colleagues who said i'm always afraid of saying the wrong thing mm -hmm. and i you know generally said the wrong thing for whom or make people uncomfortable who are you afraid of making uncomfortable yeah. because the students of color or the lgbtq students or the disabled students are already uncomfortable but to say that it's not right way we are all learners here and we need to examine what are we gaining and what are we losing with what we are saying and the way we are intervening is a very helpful way of thinking so thank you yeah thank you thank you so much everyone um for participating and engaging and uh thinking with us around all of this i'm going to pass it back to dr jane arungu Thank you so much, Abigail, and uh, your Rehearsals of Life team from the University of Oregon. We thank you so very much for engaging us. I want to thank everybody who attended. If you have any questions pertaining to this presentation, Abigail I was kind enough to say you can directly contact her or you can contact us at ncowebinars at ou.edu. So thank you very much. This recording is going to be made available in five to seven days and it's gonna be emailed directly to you. So thank you all uh, from the University of Oklahoma here in Norman. We appreciate you all. Thank you to our ASL uh, interpreters and captioner. Uh, and thank you to all who participated. 
have a good afternoon or evening for some. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.